Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. My name is Kyle, founder of Hilton Wine and Spirits, and welcome to our 12th ish uh, wine tasting. I think this is our 12th. Uh, I probably should have checked that before, but it's been a heck of a day today. Um, my goodness, it's been a day, and I am so ready for wine. And uh, it is really, really hot outside, and even hotter under these lights. So uh, I imagine you're ready for some ice cold white wine as well. So let's uh, let's pour ourselves a little of this Pinot Blanc while we jump right into this. So this might be our nerdiest tasting so far. We shall uh, we shall see. Aaron assures me this is in fact our twelfth, uh, or we have only twelve viewers, which would be a disaster. But it's probably our twelfth. Um, so our topic tonight is Pinot, and it's not Pinot Noir or Pinot Blanc or Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio or Pinot Meunier or uh, if this was the nineteen seventies Pinot Chardonnay. Uh, this is a Pinot tasting, and the reason for that is that Pinot is one great species with a variety of clones. Now, when we talk about species in wine, we're really talking about one species. Yes, there's Vitis Labrusca, which ha has its own thing going on, uh, and hybrids thereof uh, of Vitis Vinifera and Vitis Labrusca. Those are things like Marichal Foch and Bacon Noir. But broadly, all of the, the wine grapes that we see out in the world today are all one species. They're Vitis Vinifera. They can all be crossed with each other. They can all be grafted to one another. They can all be hybridized with each other. They are effectively the same species, but there are different expressions of it. Just like um, all dogs are in theory the same species, not in theory, they are the same species, Kyle, don't be an idiot. Um, just like with that, all wines are the same species, but there's a huge difference between a Toy Poodle and a Great Dane. So with all of these, one of the major, in fact, if not the most important uh, grape variety in terms of historical importance, right up into like present drinkability and present importance, is the Pinot family. And so when we talk about differences between Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir, um, we could be talking about the difference between, you know, really, really high-end, you know, first growth Grand Cru uh, Burgundy. Uh, or we could be talking about Barefoot Pinot Grigio. Or we could be talking about some weird Alsatian or Canadian wines you've never heard of before. Um, these are great varieties that, you know, Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, or Pinot Grigio these days, um, they have such an international mass of following, and yet Pinot Blanc is kind of left out in the cold here, which is so sad to me, because I really like Pinot Blanc. Um, Pinot is all one style, and there are various clones of it. Uh, and when I say clones of it, I mean um, we, have, uh, we have the same, say, just Pinot Blanc or Pinot Gris here. Um, you'll have a bunch of different varieties. This one is really good at growing in wet conditions. This one's really good at dry conditions. This one's really good at resisting viruses and mold. And this one's really, really good at, you know, surviving winter kill. And this one over here is really, really good at providing, you know, a ton of fruit. And this one over here is really good at providing, you know, a tiny amount of fruit, but a really high quality. We've been experimenting with and tampering with the Pinot species really going back to the 14th century, uh, which is when it was probably propagated from wild vines in and around Burgundy, uh, and it has since then been spot off into Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Blanc. Um, but these are terms that we use for convenience. They are not like a genetic difference. So let's get into this Pinot Blanc. Okay, this is by Birgit Bronstein, uh, who is one of my favorite winemakers in the store. Uh, we carry her Pinot Blanc and we carry her Pure Rosé. Uh, this is from Austria in the Burgenland region. So this is a region that is very close to the border to uh, Hungary as well. And you get that, okay, Pinot Blanc in some parts of the world. Um, was really referred to as being the same as Chardonnay for a very long time. Uh, if you're in South America to this day, uh, a lot of the Chilean Chardonnay you actually drink is probably about 30, 40% Pinot Blanc. Pinot Blanc and Chardonnay uh, have a real similarity in flavor profile and aroma profile. And they, they're very often treated identically uh, to the point where Pinot Blanc is actually allowed. Um, it's not usually seen in like the prestige uh, cuvées from Burgundy. You wouldn't find Pinot Blanc probably in a Corton Charlemagne, for example. But if you bought like a, you know, a Bourgogne Blanc or you bought a Macon Blanc or a Macon Vergesson or a Macon Salutre, something from kind of southern Burgundy where it butts up against Beaujolais, um, they're actually allowed to put a surprising percentage, 15% of Pinot Blanc into those wines, even though, you know, in theory, all of, you know, Burgundian white legally has to be Chardonnay. 
Uh, I'm not seeing a lot of comments here. Uh, Aaron, are you seeing more than four comments on your side? No, we're still okay. You know, if, if someone wanted to throw down a comment just to make sure I know you're there and the comment software is working properly. So this is Pinot Blanc. Of the three Pinot exemplars that we have here, Pinot Noir with its red skins, Pinot Gris with its pink skins, and Pinot Blanc with its green skins, it's the least prestigious. It's the least well-known. I don't think there's anywhere in the world where it's actually done as a very, very serious variety, at least not as a prestige variety. You know, like with Pinot Gris, we can say, oh, well, you know, around Venice, around the Alto Adige in northeastern Italy, it's a prestige grape variety. Um, in Alsace, where the term Grand Cru is rather thrown around quite loosely, there are several Grand Crus where they make Pinot Gris. Uh, Pinot Gris is grown all through Germany. It's grown in the mosel saar It's grown through Falze. It's grown in Baden. It's grown absolutely everywhere, and sometimes a very, very high quality. Pinot Gris is everywhere. But Pinot Blanc, it's kind of a bit of a misfit, you know? It doesn't have the prestige of Burgundy or the prestige of New Zealand, or it doesn't have, you know, the, the, the universal popularity of Pinot Grigio. You know, it's grown very successfully in Alsace. It's grown quite successfully in Canada. It's grown, you know, with a great deal of success, but almost entirely for local consumption in Germany. Uh, and it's done, you know, in Austria, it's done in Hungary. I've seen it out of Australia. I've seen it out of the United States. Pinot Blanc is never the star. It's always kind of there. It's kind of, you know, Steve Buscemi of grape varieties. You know, it's never, you know, going to win best actor, but they're always kind of there. And that's why I like Pinot Blanc. It's rather like a Chardonnay. It's a little higher in acid than most Chardonnays. Uh, and I use that most characteristic because you could grow Pinot Blanc in like the Santa Barbara Highlands where it's basically a kiln and you'll get a big fat, fat, fat flabby Pinot Blanc uh, that will give you tons and tons and tons of alcohol and is really suited to oak aging. Uh, whereas you could also take a Chardonnay and make a Chablis out of it and drive up the acidity to a really, really high degree and have a really powerful, like crisp, snappy Chardonnay. It doesn't mean that you know Pinot Blanc and Chardonnay can't cross over, but in general, Pinot Blanc is a little more acidity and it's a little bit tighter, uh, and I don't mind that. I like the kind of the fresh, appley roundness of it. I love how earthy this actually finishes in my mouth. You know, you get it in your mouth and it's like, okay, it's just, it's happy juice. It wants to be drank. It's, it's light and it's fresh and it's fruity and it wants to be your friend and it gets in your mouth and then it just sits down. And you get this incredible salinity and you get this earthiness. It's like, oh, this isn't like a 1695 bottle of wine. This has some power. This has some weight. This has some interest. Uh, Birgit Bronstein uh, is if not the most famous, one of the two or three most famous uh, women winemakers from Austria, Hungary, and even into Germany. Um, she kind of casts a bit of a long shadow. Uh, she's one of the earlier biodynamic uh, Demeter certified winemakers from this part of the world. Uh, she's won basically every award there is to win in Austria for her wines. Uh, and really at this point, um, she's almost kind of semi-retired. Uh, she has a couple of twin sons uh, that she's actually handing some of the winemaking off off to now, uh, which just what a legend, what an absolutely spectacular winemaker. Aaron, I still have absolutely zero comments at this point. Would you look really? in to see if uh, maybe just people are not commenting or if maybe there's something weird with my, uh, with my side? Okay, because I've got no comments. I got the first four and nothing since. Okay, so let's move merrily right along. For the record, I hate that tablet. I hate that tablet so much. Um, Aaron used to give me his awesome laptop. It was janky and always did a Windows update at the worst time, but it was good and I liked it. And now we have this tablet, which is worse. But let's jump right along. Let's stop giving Aaron a hard time for the minute. You know, we'll get back to giving him a shitty time. Oh, hello, Hand. Thank you for dropping by. Do you want the first one? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. So let's jump into the Seeberg Grauburgunder. So Grauburgunder is one of the 
incredibly massive number of different synonyms that Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio has around the world. So literally it means gray grape or pink grape from Burgundy, which says it's from the Pinot family uh, and it's from, and, and it has pink skins. So it's very, very pretty. This was actually the white wine at my wedding uh, a few summers ago. And I actually picked out a much more expensive red wine to do. And the white one was just like, okay, we're in the 702 wing. It's going to be hot. It's not air conditioned. I just want something refreshing for everybody. I sourced like a super exclusive keg. We had a feature cocktail with a really fancy red wine. And all anybody wanted to talk about all night was the white wine. And this was the white wine. And I still love it for that. This is one of, I think in summer, unless we have a display of something else at the counter, this is our best selling white wine in the store in summer every year because it's just, it's magic. I love how just clean and fresh and fun and just very lightly off dry this wine is. Hey, we finally got comments. Hooray. Uh, so this, <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to pay attention to the, the comment section as well that's getting fixed. Um, this is the type of white wine that I think is the perfect example of why Pinot Grigio sells so well. If every Pinot Grigio that I sell for, you know, 14, 15 bucks for, you know, every day, like out on the back deck consumption, wow, we have a lot more comments than I thought. That's very nice. Um, then I think that the world would be in a really, really good place. This is, to me, the ideal patio wine. It's light, it's fresh, it's got a touch of sweetness, it's got great acidity, it's got beautiful varietal character, it's identifiably Pinot Grigio. And we don't think of it as being, you know, when you think Pinot Grigio, what do I think of? I think of like bad Pinot Grigio out of California, I think of great Pinot Grigio out of Italy, I think about Canada kind of getting there on the premium Pinot Grigio game. I think about Alsace, I think about, you know, New Zealand actually does a really, really good Pinot Grigio scene. I don't necessarily immediately think about, you know, Austria or Germany or Hungary for Pinot Gris, but there's a ton of it planted there. Uh, and they do some really, really interesting work with it with wines like this. I'm going to try and, uh, and catch up with the comments because uh, I could not see them for the absolute longest time. Oh, wow, there are so many comments I did not see. God, this tablet's the worst. I'm never going to stop giving you a hard time. <laughs> and yes, Darren, it is the perfect evening for a chilled white wine, especially after my day. Good Lord, what a day. Explain the difference between the Pinot grapes. Details. OK. Um, I tried to cover this briefly, but uh, not having the comments to slow me down and make me go through it in a more thorough way. They're all the same thing. They're all the same exact species, varietal. They're different clones, but broadly, Genetically, you can even find on a single bunch of grapes, you can actually have kind of the dark purple blue grapes that are your Pinot Noir. You can have anywhere from kind of like slightly gray blue dusky grapes right up to slightly brownish yellow grapes, which are your Pinot Gris. And finally, have the bright green grapes, which are Pinot Blanc. Um, those whole clusters are rare. Those are really only vines that are 100, 150 years old. Um, those, oh, and told the grapes are on the screen. Uh, those are. Just they're not the most common in the world. Those vines that still do that are fairly old and usually used for some very, very high end wines. And the reason used for high end wines is you have to send pickers out three times for this. You send your pickers out, you know, about the third week of September, this is depending on region, but let's say we're just in Burgundy, about the second or third week in September to pick the Pinot Blanc. You'd send them out about five to eight days later to pick the Pinot Gris and about another week, 10 days after that to pick the Pinot Noir. And they're not just picking bunches. They're picking individual berries off bunches of grapes to separate these. Now, the modern clones of Pinot, of which there's more than a thousand commercially propagated clones of Pinot, um, they tend to be at least, you know, if not entirely true to vine, like everything is Pinot Gris or everything is Pinot Blanc or Pinot Noir, at least individual bunches will be reliable to the specific color of grape. And yeah, the Pinot Blanc does tend to be very crushable, doesn't it? It's, it's a very easy wine to drink. Uh, I'm really, really happy to see, you know, comments again. Thank you. Um, biodynamic, yes. So there is 
Organic, which is a legal term, it is a certification, but so is biodynamic. Biodynamic has more to do with, um, with organic, it's simply you don't use pesticides, you don't er use herbicides, you don't do particular practices that are not organic in the vineyard. With biodynamic, it's taking a step further. It's you know planting grasses in between the rows to encourage predators to be there to deal with the insect population. It is harvesting deliberately at night during the coldest part of the day to drive up acid in the grapes. It is basically making wine in tune with the natural cy cycles of nature and the natural cycles of the earth and doing more than just the bare minimum with organic and actually saying, well, not only are we not using herbicide, we're finding something better to do with that same soil by using those, you know, normally bare patches between the vines to encourage, you know, roses to encourage pollinators, or we're putting in grasses to encourage predators, or we're, you know, running cows up and down between the vines to fertilize the soil rather than using um, inorganic uh, fertilizers. It's, uh, it's, it's a whole process. The difference between organic and biodynamic is actually quite staggering. And then you take a step further into natural, uh, where you actually say, okay, well, we're not going to use any, you know, artificial processes at all, other than maybe a touch of sulfur at bottling to actually make the wines. Uh, what is the ideal glassware of the styles tonight? Okay, glassware is a super controversial issue, uh, which I will cover if you really want me to. I. I have a couple of friends who are big believers in glassware, and they have the whole Riedel and Spiegelau catalog where they have 15 different glasses for 15 different types of wines. And does Pinot taste slightly better out of the Pinot glass? Sure, it's fine. Um, but is it worth like the 60 bucks for the glass for the Pinot to smell 1% better? I've never been entirely convinced. Uh, I really like these glasses, the Gabriel glass, uh, which is, I'm not going to say a knockoff, but a bit of a a well-made clone of a much more expensive Austrian glass. Um, these are a glass that Devin actually discovered when he was in Austria and Hungary. Uh, this was what he found most of the better wineries were actually using as their tasting bar glassware. We sell these in the shop. Um, they're not the most robust glassware in the world. They are definitely delicate. In the time that we've been doing these online tastings over 12 weeks, I have broken, well, I haven't broken any. Devin's broken one and so is hand. But uh, no, they're, they're very, very nice, and they, they work for a large, different uh, variety of wines. So I like these. Oh, man, I want bridge pizza. I want pizza in general, but yeah, bridge would be on my way home. It's a controversial topic. It is a very, very controversial topic. That's certainly true. Almost as sweet as me. Thank you, Mike. That's very nice. You're much nicer to me than Aaron. Uh, I think we are there for comments, unless the comments are broken again. We shall see. Uh, but let's uh, let's just take a si uh, an aside here with the two wines that are both based in Pinot Grigio. Um, so this is done as a way. So Pinot Grigio are pink-skinned Pinot grapes, and they can be grown anywhere in the world. And there's a ton of different names for Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, or I wrote down a few of the synonyms because there's just so many. Uh, Toque comes from Alsace. Grauburgunder is what they call it in Austria and Hungary. Malvoisie is what they call uh, Pinot Gris when it's grown in the Loire Valley, which isn't very common anymore. Uh, Pinot Boreau you will see uh, in Burgundy. Uh, Ruländer is a very old German and Austrian name that they used to use to say it's Pinot Gris, just like your Grauburgunder, but we made it sweet. Uh, Sivi Pinot is uh, the Slovenian name for it, and on and on and on. Pinot Grigio has never really been a you know major major variety anywhere. It, it's kind of like Pinot Blanc if Pinot Blanc started getting cool about 2001. When Pinot Grigio took off, everyone all of a sudden started exporting it, and they all started making it in their own unique styles. Now, that quickly died out as everybody learned that, oh, we just want to ape the Italian style and make it that way. But there's still unique styles, and the Seabrook is still very German. It's a little lower in alcohol. It's got a touch more residual sweetness. It's got a lot more brightness. It's got much higher acid. I really like this one. I, I'm, I've lingered on this probably longer than I should because is it the most interesting thing on the table? I'd say arguably in terms of complexity, it may be the least interesting thing on the table, but it's still my favorite to just stand around and drink and talk about while Aaron fixes the comments. Speaking of, hello, Hand. You're a glass behind. We're just about to go on to the Ramato. Uh, 
Uh, the name of the brand is Gabriel Glass, and we do sell them in the store. Um, we thought they were going to be a huge hit for us at Christmas. That did not pan out. Um, they have honestly started selling um, quietly since we just started doing these wine tastings uh, because people have asked, hey, what's the glass you keep using in the tastings? And we've actually started selling more since we do started doing these. But yeah, they're, they're not a cheap glass at 35, but considering the, uh, the officially licensed ones, by the time I got them over here and everything, it would be 75 to $90. I think they're a darn good deal at 35 Why am I so into Pinot? Oh, there are so many reasons to be into Pinot. I mean, it's, it is along with Savignon, which itself is a child grape of Pinot and Gouet Blanc. Uh, there's 156 different major or minor Western like grape varieties that are descended just from those three grapes. So if we say that, you know, Savignon is already a, a child grape of Pinot, if we just take Pinot and Gouet Blanc and their, their child grape Sauvignon, um, which is not a crossing with Gouet, that's a bunch of other grapes, but 156 different varieties that are still grown and still commercially propagated and still used all over the world to this day. Um, things like Chardonnay, things like Gamay, things like uh, Melon de Bourgogne, which is the grape variety behind uh, Muscadet. Uh, you've got so many different grape varieties that are used uh, in so many different wines that come from just Pinot and Gouet Blanc. Um, Gouet Blanc is not a topic I really want to talk about tonight, uh, but I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. I have had a couple of examples of Gouet Blanc in my life. Uh, they're, it's still grown uh, pretty commonly in South France as an individual variety. It's mostly used for brandy, but every so often it shows up as a curiosity for wine nerds. Uh, and it tastes like shitty Trebbiano. It tastes like absolutely nothing. It tastes like white wine, you know? It tastes like the background noise. It tastes like barefoot Pinot Grigio without, you know, 500 tons of sugar added to it. It's not desperately interesting, but it's, it's fascinating, and I always try one when I see them around, because it's a parent grape to so much of what we now consider like classic grape varieties in the Western world. Just, I mean, the, the big one is, you know, Pinot plus Gouet Blanc equals Chardonnay, but I mean, so many other varieties are crossings of either Gouet and Pinot or Gouet and Sauvignon. Uh, it's just, it's a fascinating grape. I don't have one in the store uh, because why would I? Um, nobody would buy it and it's not that interesting, so I wouldn't recommend it. But it's just, it's a fascinating grape in its historical sense. Uh, and it's so genetically diverse and so genetically interesting that people are still trying it. Like, you know, people are still, when they, they sit down and like are trying to improve Riesling, or they're trying to improve Sauvignon Blanc, or they're trying to improve, you know, Shiraz, you know, they, they'll still try crossing it with Gouet Blanc just because it's one of those great varieties that spun off so many great things, despite the fact that it itself kind of admittedly sucks, that it's, it's difficult to not have it out there. Why is, ha why is uh, high acid so nice? Because when it's well chilled, acid tastes refreshing. It's what makes lemonade work. It's what makes um, kombucha work. A acid, right up to the point where it's aggressively sour, acid is just pure refreshment. I mean, the, the only reason that Coca-Cola works with that much bloody sugar in it is the fact it has really, really high acidity to keep it refreshing. People say, oh, well, I don't like acidic wines. Well, unless you like wines that taste like alcohol and sugar, which God knows that's apothic red, but unless you like wines that really don't taste like much of anything, as long as you like some refreshing aspect in your wine at all, you do like acid in your wines. It is, to me at least, beyond alcohol, beyond you know aromatics and flavors, beyond sugar content, the acidity content of the wine is perhaps the most interesting thing. And there's, there's a variety of different acids that are used in wine. Um, very fresh, light, un oak aged whites like this will be based around malic acid. Uh, when they're aged in oak barrels or if they have the, the particular bacteria added to them, they'll become lactic acid and the wines will taste very rich and creamy. Uh, with red wines, of course, and some orange wines, you have the, the high tannin content that's coming in and making the wine very tart. Uh, and that, of course, is an acid that's coming from the grape skins you get a little bit of everything. And actually with this wine, there'll be some tannic component because that pink 
pink, th there are absolutely grapes that have, you know, juice that is stained pink or stained red. They're, they're called tenturiers. Uh, and they're usually hybrid varieties, actually, uh, between uh, Vitis Labrisca and Vitis viniferis. But when we see a pink wine, there's, there's only certain ways you can do it. Um, there's the Sagné method, which I'm not going to describe tonight because it's incredibly complicated and I don't like talking about it. Uh, there is the traditional method of making uh, rosés, which is to say you take a, you know, a dark red skin grape and you leave it in contact with the juice for like an hour or two just to draw a little bit of pink color out of it. Uh, there is just straight what they do with the Sturm Rosé. When we had Ryan Sturm on here a couple, three weeks ago, uh, they take a white wine, 98%, and they add 2% red wine to it to make the wine slightly pink. That's absolutely a way you can do it. With this, they do it a little different. This is a, what we call a Ramato or a copper wine. Pinot Grigio has pink skins. So if you add the skins to the wine, just like if you were making a red, and you let it sit for, I don't know, a couple of days, you have the wine that kind of tastes very much like a red wine because it has a higher tannin content, but it can't become that dark red because the skins aren't dark red. The skins are pink, so it dyes the wine slightly pink. So you could say this is a Ramato Pinot Grigio. You could say in a certain sense this is a red wine because it uses a pigmented grape skin to dye the wine a darker color. You could call it an orange wine, but that's not technically correct because orange wines are generally a white wine grape with green skins used to age with the juice to actually impart more flavor and tannin without changing the color of the wine. This kind of sits on its own little pedestal. It's not a red, it's not a white, it's in a sense a rosé, but it's so much more. This is, you know, 1895 a bottle. It's not exactly the world's most expensive bottle of wine, but there's so much history and so much uniqueness to this that this is a style they've made in the Venezia area going back to about the 17th century. This is something really unique to this part of the world. They've made it since absolute donkeys years ago. It's really cool, and I absolutely love this. It's it is definitely the least expensive wine on the table, and it's still absolutely charming. Uh, if this is your favorite wine in the lineup, I do not blame you, because this absolutely rocks. Is sideways worth a wine? Absolutely it is. Um, there's, there's so much to like about sideways. It's so bad, but it's so good. Well, it smells like Paris. Rosé usually does, because they love serving rosé on the patties of Paris. Uh, how do you pronounce Seabrick? Uh, with a hard C-H. Uh, and the only reason I'm going to say that is Klaus Kespler, who is the gentleman who actually uh, sells us the Seabrick line. That's how he pronounces it. Uh, fun story about this wine, actually. Um, the very, very first time we got pitched this wine, uh, and I told this story when we tasted this a few weeks ago, but um, he brought it to us with all these really, really bad like clip art pictures of seahorses and starfish and flounders and all sorts of things all over the label. And it was called Cuvée de Fruit de Mer, the, the blend for seafood, which was the absolute dumbest thing. And we all said, okay, we love the wine. Please, for the love of God, get this awful clip art nightmare off the front of the bottle. Uh, and to their credit, they did. They, this is how they sell it in Germany. The, the terrible starfish label was purely for the North American market. They do still sell it to this day with that label in the US market. And apparently they do quite well. No comment on what that means. But at least for us, we wanted the German label, uh, and it's done exceedingly well for us. Uh, Cuvée de Fouy de Mer, which, again, that's French. It's a German wine. I don't get it. I don't understand it, but that's, what the, that's how they pitched it to us. Oh, yeah, and this and strawberries. Oh, yeah. I, I love... Devin gets mad at me because I, he loves really serious, interesting rosé that teaches you something. And I'm just the opposite. I'm like, yeah, this is fun. Um, I, I, I don't drink. I, I, I do enjoy really complex, serious, you know, not messing about rosé. I do. But mostly what I like is just very relaxing, fun, light wines like this that just, is this going to teach me a whole great deal? Not really, but it, it's fun and I enjoy it and it's, it's pleasant and God, it's just every time I come back to glass, there is a little bit more. Is the most, you know, interesting thing in the world? No, but is it delightful every time I come back? Is it always a little bit different? Yeah, it is. And I like that. Hey, and I see you waiting patiently. The red already. Wow, you cut up quickly.
Rob, does your Seabrook come with a no label? Well, that is that is occasionally the danger with dealing with little tiny wineries. Um, normally, the labelless wines get put into a special staff box that then get drank because uh, it does happen at least with tiny wineries very often. You know, a lot of these bottles are being done on like a hand labeler. You know, very often by like the winemaker's son because he wants you know instead of shoveling the walks, you know, you get to label wine bottles for two hours. You know, that's how you earn your allowance. Uh, so no, a, a lot of the time with these smaller wineries, we do find bottles that have a missing label, and I apologize for that. Does Apothic use Pinot grapes? Probably. Um, ooh, that's an interesting question. Okay, yes and no. Um, it uses Pinot grapes, but maybe not for the reasons you might think. Uh, Apothic is effectively a wine that is not grown, it is bought. And what I mean by that is when you are in California, you will find what are called tank farms. And I don't use that term derisively because you can make a very, very good wine from the, the wines that they actually make. Um, effectively what these are is let's say Seabrick happened to be Seabrich and it was in California. And their market research said, okay, last year we sold 10,000 cases. This year, best case scenario, we can sell 12,000 cases. But we had a bumper crop. We had an absolutely perfect year. With the fruit we've harvested, we have enough wine to make 15,000 cases. Our salespeople could be wizards and we couldn't sell that. We are stuck with 3,000 cases worth of wine. What do we do with it? Well, you can just put it on the open market. You can make the wine yourself, put it in a well refrigerated, like temperature controlled truck, bring it over to a tank farm, and people will go in. Grocery stores, big chains, and the apothic folks. And they'll run down the tanks and say, okay, that's pretty good. I will give you $70 per 100 liters of that sort of thing. Well, you know, it's, it's a tiny amount of money on the, on, the, on the big scale. But they'll say, okay, that's really nice Pinot Grigio. I'll pay this much for it. And sometimes it goes to auction. Sometimes it will sit as kind of like a, an open bidding process and they take the highest bid for it. But basically, anybody can buy it. So, you know, hey, you know, Fetzer's Pinot Grigio from 2018 was so good, but they never equaled it again. Well, Fetzer's not exactly an estate wine. They buy wine on the open market to do it. Maybe a really exceptional producer was looking to get rid of some grapes that year and they bought that wine. That happens all the time. So Apothic is not a wine that is necessarily the same blend every year. It's not necessarily the same anything every year. And let's be fair, they add sugar to bring up the alcohol. They vacuum distill it to bring the alcohol back down if they need to. They add artificial acidity. They add oak chips to add flavor. They muck with wine so much that it really doesn't matter what the base material was, that they will eventually come to the desired flavor profile, which is sweet, oaky, boozy, and saleable at $11.95. That's not to malign it unfairly. I think I've maligned it very fairly. Uh, but it fills a certain market niche. And when you say, oh, is there Pinot Noir and Apothic Red? Sometimes. Depends what you know was on the block that day and that they got for the price they needed to per 100 liters to you know, meet their price point that they need to hit. It could have been Valdeguet or Cabernet or Shiraz or Pinot or whatever, it, it didn't really matter. They needed something that was California made, hit a certain alcohol percentage, and they could add oak chips to, to the point where it would taste like Apothic Red. Okay. Hello, Ed. Back to the rosé. You did skip a wine, you know. Okay, so let us quickly discuss what we have got coming up for the next little bit. For beer tasting on Wednesday, we're doing a little bit of a BC battle. We are going to do an IPA and a sour, and an IPA and a sour from two different BC breweries. Now, Phillips, I think, here wins the packaging competition hands down. We have the Dino Sour, Blackberry Sour, and the Pandemonium Super IPA. These are great beers, but neither of them have a panda the size of the Empire State Building shooting lasers out of its eyes. So, you know, first blood goes to Phillips. On the other hand, we have Four Winds. Uh, and Four Winds is a bit of a legend. Their, their beers are really exceptional. They're carefully made. The IPA is done with wild yeast, so it's almost like a sour. The sour is 
I don't want to tilt the scales in any way, but I love this sour so much. This is this is one of my favorite beers in the whole store. So we have two very, very different perspectives. The Phillips are, I think about $5 a four pack less expensive than the, the Four Winds, and they're wonderful and brilliant in their own way. This is very careful, meticulous, you know, I won't say more skill because it's not, it's, it's just its own different style of, of beer making. Compared to Phillips, just we're wearing our heart on our sleeve, and this is a super IPA, and this is a this is a jujube sour, and they're both such different styles that throwing them head to head, I think, is very very fun. So that's coming Wednesday, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, and then on Friday next week for our wine tasting, uh, we are back to having special guests, and we actually have already booked a special guest for each of our next two tastings. For this coming Friday. Uh, we have a little bit of a Spanish spectacular, uh, and this is featuring Matt Sherlock of Sedimentary Wines. Uh, now, Matt was uh, part of the two-person team that were really the first uh, importing agency in Alberta to focus on natural wines. Uh, without Matt and Mike, there really wouldn't be an Eric Mercier, there wouldn't be uh, Andrew Stewart. We wouldn't have had so many like crazy, amazing, like small importers. It would have all been like the big chain guys that we've seen forever. Um, I love the sedimentary portfolio, and we've worked with them for, oh Lord, like three, four years at least at this point. Uh, so we're going to do a cava, which is kind of the, the, the champagne of Spain. And I don't say that in a, in a derogatory way. I say it in the sense that other than using you know, local Spanish grape varieties, they have to obey all the champagne laws, make it in exactly the same way as champagne. They have all the same quality standards and everything else. It just happens to be from Spain. Then we get into Vina Illusion. We have the red, which is done in carbonic maceration style, like a Beaujolais. So that's going to be, I'm going to have mine lightly chilled. How about that? This is, this is patio red, and I'm looking forward to it like crazy. Uh, and then we have something really, really cool. Uh, in the late 1980s, um, Tempranillo, the main grape of Spain, other than Garnacha, mutated, and it created a white mutant. Uh, much like you know, Pinot Noir became Pinot Blanc or Pinot Gris, the same thing happened to Tempranillo. And as a result, we are now starting to see like commercial Tempranillo Blancos come out of Spain. Uh, 11 cases of this came to Alberta. I bought 10 of them, five for this event, and then five to put a case stack at the till. I wonder who bought the 11th. Somebody got one case of this. Um, and then finally, uh, we have the Elis de Vigneron. Uh, these guys make some really, really, really interesting wines. Um, We've had their stuff in and out of the store in the past, but it's never really stuck around very long. Uh, this was one that uh, Matt from Sedimentary really pushed on us because he thought it was really exceptional. Uh, of all the ones on the table, it's the only one I haven't had. I think this could be really cool. I know these are cool. So a little bit of a Spanish focus again. We've got a, nat a really foundational natural wine importer. And beyond that, Matt is also the head winemaker at Lock and Worth. So like we've got a winemaker, a wine importer, foundational guy. I think it's going to be really, really fun. And then two weeks from now, uh, we have uh, the head winemaker for Nugan Wines out of Australia. Uh, and. He actually shot a promo video for us uh, for this, so uh, I'm sure you're all sick to death of my promo videos that I do for you. Uh, actually, uh, in two weeks, he'll be shooting live from Australia uh, a promo video for you, which has been really, really fun. So that's what's coming. Let's jump into the red. We may revisit, well, I'll be revisiting but we may revisit later. So this is by Meinklang. Uh, we've had Meinklang wines uh, on the channel before. Uh, don't remember if it was the, uh, can't remember if it was the Cuvée Weiss or if it was the Gruner, but I think it was the Cuvée Weiss. Um, this is, to Devon and I's mind, and has been for quite some time, the best under $30 Pinot in the entire store. Pinot Noir is brutally difficult to grow. I've seen lots of $10 to $15 Pinot Noirs come through the store and they probably taste like cherry jam. Not a whole hell of a lot else. They are boring, they're one dimensional. Pinot requires concentration, it requires an understanding of the soil that you're growing it on, it requires incredible deftness and technique with winemaking. Even in Burgundy, where you know there are, if you make an exceptional Burgundy, and it gets 100 points in Robert Parker, wherever, 
you can automatically say, okay, for the next 10 years, our Burgundy is $5,000 a bottle. Even those cats get it wrong because Burgundy is voodoo. Pinot Noir is voodoo. It's difficult to make well, and it's far more difficult to make well on a budget. If you come in and you want a Pinot Noir for under $20, I have like two in the store. And definitely make a focus on trying to find Pinot that doesn't suck under $25. Under 30, I am as happy as I've ever been with our selection right now. So we have this, we have the Manor de Cara, we have the Lejeune stuff. It's, it's good right now, but this is the best of the lot. This smells like elevated, pretty, perfumed cherries and raspberries, and it's so, so incredibly pretty. Like everything we've had up to this point. And these are all under $30 wines. This is the most expensive, admittedly, but they're all under 30 quite comfortably. Um, this just smells like love and magic to me. I love how pretty and gorgeous and elevated. This reminds me of, I don't know, the way candy smelled as a kid. This is just so pretty. And in the mouth, that, that big over-the-top fruit character. And there, there's some wet stones and some gravel and things too, but that, that fruit character all of a sudden comes into your mouth and it's like, oh, joke's on you. I'm a lot drier than you thought it was going to be. You, you smelled that and you thought this was going to be off dry. No, it's not. It's actually bone dry. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And the alcohol is so low. This is 12% alcohol. I think it's actually the lowest alcohol we've had on anything tonight, including the German of all things. Um, and that's because... Pinot Noir doesn't need the baking heat. Um, this is something we got into with Brett Rowland from uh, Avril Creek when we did the Canadian tasting. It's all about where you're growing it in the world. If you're growing Monastrell uh, in the south of Spain, Monastrell needs to be cooked effectively in a kiln. It needs to be grown in hot, rocky soils that hold their heat even overnight. So even at midnight, you go out and you hold your hand over the soil and it's reflecting that heat. It, Monastrell needs that. It needs to cook. Pinot never wants to cook. Pinot wants to be kept in the shade. It wants to be kept cool. It wants to be shaded and just, it wants to have that pretty high acid because that's what actually pulls off all these delicate aromas. You can make a hot climate Pinot and there are some really interesting Pinots from South Africa, from Tasmania, but you think about that, certain parts of South Africa are shockingly cold because they're getting the, uh, the Antarctic current. Uh, certain parts of Tasmania, the same thing and it's very, very high up. I can't think, and maybe Devin will call me out here shortly, I can't think of a single, single Pinot Noir I really like that I, that I genuinely like, would look forward to or order off a wine list on like you know, an anniversary dinner or something that comes from a hot part of the world. You know, I, I don't think anybody here has ever seen like a, you know, a, a Lodi or a Santa Barbara County Pinot Noir that like melted their brains. I can't imagine anybody's ever been to like, you know, the McLaren Vale or Barossa or even, even the southern part of the Okanagan near Asoya is where it gets so damn hot in the summer. I don't think those Pinot Noirs are really worth your time. Pinot Noir has to be grown kind of in the if we get a really, really bad freeze, everything's going to die sort of climate area. It, it needs to be right on that cusp, the, the place where in the vineyard where it's too cold to grow anything else, but the soils are right. Pinot Noir, and the other thing about Pinot Noir is it's, if anyone else is getting dill off this, I'm right there with you, by the way. Pinot is a reflection on the soil it's grown on. And I am not the world's greatest Pinot expert. I'm just not. But there are people out there who will tell you, you know, this Pinot was grown on slate because it smells like blueberries or was grown on decomposed granite because it smells like um, salted toffee. I'm making things up at this point. But, but you know the, the point I'm trying to make here. Pinot is a reflection, is a mirror grape. It shows the soil it was grown on, especially in the Pinot Noir expression. And I love it for that because I can taste a Pinot that is grown at the exact same climatic conditions, the exact same year. Uh, they can be given the same oak treatment of anything at all. The same yeast is added uh, to ferment it. Everything is done identically. But if one was grown on slate and one was grown on decomposed granite, they're gonna be wildly different wines from each other. And I love that so much. What food were they considered with the mind clang? Um, soft goat cheese. Um, something really interesting and funky and challenging. Um, not the really insane stuff that's gonna completely dominate your palate, but something just a little bit interesting.
And yeah, Rob, this does remind me a little bit of the Cuvée Clint. Yes, it does. Uh, which again, not a surprise. Like I said, most of those grape varieties out there, like 156 of them are descended from Pinot, including Pinot Tage, which is a hybrid of, you know, Pinot Noir and Senso. So yeah, uh, the idea that, you know, Pinot Tage and Pinot Noir would have some similar like flavor compounds, not surprising. It's, you know, father and son. You might have your mom's hair or your dad's eyes. That's literally the same thing between Pinot Noir and Senso. That makes sense. They should taste similar. Uh, this looks cloudy. Function of style. Function of not filtering it. Um, because this is a natural wine, uh, actually I was talking with Devin about this. This is actually one of the larger natural wine producers in the world. Uh, a lot of natural wine producers, you know, you, you go to the winery and it's like, this little tiny like industrial bay, or it's like this little tiny like cow shed out behind the winery. They're, they're tiny, tiny, tiny facilities. Mein Klein is actually quite large. Um, Devin was there uh, this past fall, and he said, yeah, they're, they're bigger than you'd think. You know, they have their, their herd of cows that wanders up and down the vines, and it's a much bigger herd of cows than you'd think. I, I jokingly said, oh, do they all have names? He said, no, they have way more cows than you could possibly name. Um, which I think just shows the lack of creativity. I can think of at least 100 names, probably, like Steve and Tim and <laughs> Mike. Um, but you know, you, 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 this is a larger uh, natural wine producer, which there isn't that many of. A lot of them are little tiny, tiny producers uh, that don't do a ton of stuff. This is actually someone doing natural wine at a high quality level and at a really good price point on a larger scale, which I really like. And yes, not filtered, no animal products added. So, you know, there's no eyes and glass. There's no fish, uh, sorry, fish bladders. There's no bull's blood. There's none of, there's no uh, egg white added to keep the wine from being, you know, animal content. Al, can I ship to BC? Well, I would like to, but I have no idea what the legality is on that right now. Um, in theory, if you listen to liquor board law and provincial law, no, I wildly can't. I would lose my license and go to jail. If you look at federal law, yes, there's absolutely nothing to prohibit me selling nationwide. If that makes any sense to you, please let me know, because it makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Um, there are a lot of stores that have set up like web stores that ship nationwide, and they aren't getting in any trouble, but it really would be just you know, a provincial liquor board bringing the heat down on the operation to say, no, our rules say you can't do that. Provincial law trumps federal for whatever reason and just come down on you. Um, the interprovincial shipping laws are an absolute mess. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can ship to you or not. And that's great, isn't it? Uh, food pairing suggestions, Julie. Ooh, with pe this. Um, anything Pinot Noir and mushrooms is absolute magic. I love Pinot Noir and mushrooms just like I like Riesling and mushrooms. Um, I would cook the mushrooms in a cheap Riesling, like the, the bottom end gun trim we sell for like $14.95. Uh, it's inexpensive, but it's actually decent Riesling. I'd cook the mushrooms in that in like a hot pan and just lots of butter and just, just caramelize the outside of the mushrooms, toss in the Riesling because that smell of mushrooms cooking and Riesling is perfect, and then spread them over like, I don't know, uh, Chateaubriand or like a really slow cooked beef roast. So you get that, that lean beef character that works so well with Pinot, and then you get the mushrooms cooked in Riesling. Maybe a little, you know, fresh thyme, fresh rosemary. Sorry, what were we having wine tasting? Pardon me, uh, I was thinking about beef. Uh, rankings, ooh. This is hard. I have no idea where to rank these. I mean, this is brilliant. This is fun. This is something I've personally bought a lot of. I really, there's, there's, a, there's a part of me that always wants to root for the underdog, so I can't give the Pinot Blanc last place. That's what everybody does, and that seems so mean because it's so good. Ooh, rankings. Rankings, rankings, rankings. <laughs> Uh, 
Three, four, two, one. I can respect that. I really can. Let me come back to this just briefly to remind myself why I shouldn't put it last. God, that rules, but, um, okay. With the caveat, with the asterisk that is hot and humid and gross outside. One, two, three, four. And I feel dirty about everything that did that got below two because this is so pretty and perfect for patio weather and it's so damn hot outside and it's just infinitely refreshing. This is way this is technically I think the best wine on the table. It's got so much to offer. It's so interesting. It's just exploding out of the glass into my nostrils and I love it for that. This is the least expensive thing on the table and it, it runs up with thirty dollar wines with no problem. And I love you, Pinot Blanc. I really do. I think you're a brilliant, brilliant grape. I think you have so much to offer the world. I think you're so underappreciated, but yeah, number four. Four, one, three, two. No, don't be sorry. Never be sorry for being wrong. It's okay to be wrong, Craig. Uh, Lindsay says three, two, four, one. Yeah, I completely respect that. Three, two, four, one from Henriette. What's the best serving temperature for Pinot Noir? Now that is a controversial topic uh, when I'm not just making fun of Craig. Um, I actually, personally, I like this because it's low alcohol, because it's low tannin. Um, there's an argument, especially on a night like this, for bringing this out of basically the fridge and taking out and having this as your first lightly chilled glass of white wine. And then your second glass would be just very delicately chilled. And your third glass would be room temperature. And your fourth glass, because you've been sitting on the patio for the last three hours reading your book, it's probably a little warm. I don't mind that. I don't mind um, exploring a wine across a temperature gradient because all of the aroma compounds in here are all going to vaporize at different temperatures. So what this wine smells like at say four to five degrees Celsius and what this wine smells like at 19 degrees Celsius are wildly different things. And this is a wine that will show you, it's interesting and well made enough that it will show you different things at different temperature profiles. These wines, these two in the center, these are drinkers. These are straight out patio crushers. You know, if if you've you know gotten home at 5.30 and you're tired and it's been a long week and it's Friday night and you sit on the patio and you know your partner's getting home and an hour later and you said you'd cook dinner, but an hour later the bottle's empty and you're ordering pizza, that's broadly it's done its job. The two wines on the outside, they are the fine ones. This Pinot Blanc is, I think, it's gotten a bit of an unfair shake. A, because we started with it, which I still think was the right decision, but B, because just we we went with such remarkably special ones, and this is something nice about Pinot is, you know, we got to do Pinot Blanc as a white, we got to do Pinot Gris as a white, we got Pinot Gris as a rosé, we got to do Pinot Noir as a red. You could do Pinot Noir as a white, you could do Pinot Noir as a rosé. But really, we've, we've kind of explored most of the range that this grape has, and none of it's bad. Um, if anybody has really hated one of the wines, please, if somebody has a wine they really hated, Please let me know right now because I want to know why. I like this wine is interesting. I like this wine is great. And I sell a lot of wine by I like this wine. But what's far more interesting is I hate this wine because I want to know why. I want to know what's going on, what, why this wine doesn't work for you. I, I, think, I, I want to know if you think I made a mistake bringing wine into the tasting and saying, wow, Kyle, you know, three of these wines are great. What the hell's wrong with this Seabrook? Why do you think it's number one? This sucks. Why would you like that? I want to know because that's so much more interesting. Like is easy. Hate is goes right to the bone, and I love that. <laughs> Craig, I am reading your comments. Um, Yes, it is my store, uh, and I do tend to get a little brass. Um, but no, um, I'm just like that. That's fair. 
I think that's that's actually very well stated. I'm just like that. Rob says four one three two. Okay, yeah, I respect that. Uh, I I'm right there with you on this, and and I love the Pinot Blanc sliding up the rankings. I think that's very fair. Um, maybe you got a bad bottle in number four. Um, very possible. I mean, it is sealed with a cork first and foremost. It is a wine with a cork as opposed to screw caps. And you know, after uh, after Craig and I finished up on Wednesday night when we did the beer tasting, uh, we opened up a bottle of wine. And it was a very like expensive bottle of wine. In fact, it's this one right here that we wanted to taste. And I think this is an absolutely brilliant bottle of wine, but it was corked. The cork itself had a uh, bacterium embedded in the cork that you know came like this right from the cork tree. Um, you can do something about that. You can uh, chip the cork down to tiny pieces, treat it with high intensity UV light, and then glue it back together. That will give you a sterile cork, but that's expensive. Um, this wine, the cork, right from the cork tree, was infected with a particular bacterium and it made the wine taste like nasty, nasty, damp, wet cork. It is possible that your Pinot Noir was corked. It happens. I have no way of preventing it. I have no way of knowing it. Uh, occasionally we have batches of wine in the province show up where the whole batch of corks is infected and the wine gets recalled, but that's quite rare. I see that about once every other year. But the fact is any wine is sealed with a natural cork is occasionally going to show up bad. Or this is also a natural wine. You know, there's no sulfur added, there's no pesticide, there's no herbicide, there's no artificial fertilizers, nothing. It's, you know, the wine is effectively making itself to a certain point, which is actually the hardest type of winemaking to do because you're not allowed any of the little cheats and conceits. It's possible that just it was an off bottle. But if you're really not digging it at all, it's probably corked, would be my guess. And yeah, the, the color of the Pinot Noir is kind of spectacular. Like, it's, it, I have a glass full of this, the Seabrick right now because it's just patio wine to me. But yeah, the, the color on that Pinot Noir is exceptional. And yes, going back, this is something that uh, I actually, I like doing and I, I do quietly when I'm doing the tasting is I go back and retaste in a different order just to, to show different things because, you know, after this, your mouth is very accustomed to sugar. So if you go right from here to here, your mouth is going to be very primed to taste, you know, less sugar. So this wine is going to taste drier and it's going to taste, you know, firmer. I like that contrast. So yes, please do go back and forth because just going, you know, here to here versus here to here are going to give you completely different experiences with the exact same wines. Hello, Han, number four. Okay. So is this. Okay, um, paint thinner slash vinegar slash mushroom theme. Um, you know, anything you buy from us that you are not happy with, put the cork in it, put the cap back on it, return it to us. We get paid back by the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission. Um, anything I've had more than 12 months, I don't because, you know, I could have been an idiot and stored it behind my furnace or whatever. But no, if, if you buy something off our shelves and you're like, wow, this is gross. I think there's something wrong with this. Please bring it back. We get paid back, not like 95% or 80%. We get paid back 100% of, of what we paid for it. Every penny. If you don't like it, bring it back. We get refunded. If you don't like the wine, bring it back, please. Like that's, that's just an, a service that every liquor store in Alberta does offer because we all get refunded 100%. And that's not just me, that's everybody. Or it should be because they have access to the same programs I do. I won't say that every liquor store will, you know, give you the same program, but they should because they get repaid. Uh, no, this is this is easy. If you, if you think there's something wrong with the one, just bring it back. And I tasted these um, in advance. I, again, I I'm not going to defend my tasting order because a I don't need to, and b 
It, it's so subjective. I thought the Pinot Blanc had a little less acid than the Seabrook. I thought it was a little less just sprightly. I thought it was a little less just snappy. Um, was it perhaps more intense? Could it have gone after the Pinot Gris? Could it have gone there? Maybe, probably. Uh, I decided at the start that it shouldn't, and also I just I don't know. I liked opening with the Burgett Bronstein because with Pinot Grigio, there's so much to talk about with, you know, the fact it's called like 19 different things. The fact you can make it as a rosé, the fact you can make it as a, a, a white, you can make it as a slightly sparkling wine, they make it everywhere. We have the barefoot Pinot Grigio elephant in the room. With Pinot Blanc, I thought it had sufficiently little to talk about that we could talk about Pinot as a grape. Uh, the history of Pinot, its historical importance as a, a crossing and uh, a uh, hybridizing variety. I, I liked that there. Was it the right to order? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on everyone's palate, but I liked it there. And yeah, going back to a wine when your palate's kind of more adjusted to it happens sometimes. Okay, now you're all making me want to go back to the Blanc. You really are. I have nowhere to pour this out, so, well, down the hatch then, I guess. I was going to pour it in the succulent, but it would have killed the succulent. The succulent would have just straight died, and I like this. Susie gave this to us, and it's beautiful. But it, succulents are sensitive. If I poured the wine in the plant, it would have died. So let's go back to this. I did not I did not commit plant murder tonight, so there's that. And yeah, it's, it's hard not to like the Pinot Noir. Okay, I think uh, I think we're broadly through the comments, and uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, we will see you on Wednesday for the Battle of BC, and if we don't see you then, we will see you Friday with uh, Matt Sherlock of Sedimentary Wines uh, for our second exploration of Spain, because our first one went so well. Uh, for the minute, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I know I'm going to. Driving up to Calgary, get more rare beer. And then I have Sunday off, and I am going to do absolutely nothing with it. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to that very much. In the meantime, thank you very much, and good night.